Thank you very much. It's, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be back at, at IROS. Um, I'm going to talk today about the robotics part of micro and nanorobots. Before I get started, I've got a couple of disclosures I want to make. Um, disclosures of conflict of interest. I'm involved in some of the things I'm going to talk about on a financial side of things, uh, as well as patents. And I also have to disclose that I have a, a, a fantastic team that I've had the honor of supervising back in Zurich uh, over the last 20 years. It's been 20 years that uh, just last October 1st was my, my 20 year anniversary there. And uh, it's been an honor, uh, a pleasure to work with these people. And, and of course, it goes without saying that what you're gonna see in my talk really comes from a, a, a large group of people and a lot of thoughts, a lot of ideas, a lot of intellectual input from that. Uh, but coming back to, uh, uh, the robotics part of micro and nano robots, what I want to talk about. I, I, I first started thinking about, first started working in micro robotics in uh, 20, 27 years ago. I finished my PhD at Carnegie Mellon in robotics, was looking for new challenges in the field. That was 1995 and, and decided we were going to explore uh, uh, what we could do with robots at small scale. And in that, at that time, we were looking at, at manipulating uh, small objects, mainly in, in that area. Uh, and then when I moved to Zurich 20 years ago, I started thinking what the next grand challenge in that field might be. And that was trying to build real small micro and nano robots and, and finding out what they might be useful for. Now, it also happened in 2003 when I was developing some of this strategy, I was invited to also give a plenary at IROS that was in Las Vegas. And uh, there were about 700 people in the audience. I remember it was the biggest talk I'd ever given at the time. And the other thing, I, I, I this weekend went back on a server back at ETH and found my old slides, and, and it was quite an ambitious title. Robotics for Exploring Life was what it was about, and it kind of gave a vision for where I thought uh, the field of micro and, micro and nano robots was, was going to go. And it was only at the very end where I had a few slides on how we might be able to make small devices uh, and control them magnetically in the human body to, to, to cure some disease. And so that this is, uh, in a way, what's been going on since I gave that talk uh, and where we are. But, but what I wanna focus on here is not just the micro nano robots, but really how fundamental robotics is a part of that. And so we, uh, we pay close attention to the field of medical robotics and what the developments are there. And this is an advertisement I, I found some years ago on the web one evening while I was surfing. And it's uh, interesting, uh, I think it says a lot. It, it's a picture of a doctor with a, a robot arm uh, photoshopped onto him or her. And it says one part surgeon, one part machine, both parts amazing. Uh, and what they're saying is you should come to the hospital. There's a hospital down in Miami, Florida. You should come to our hospital because we have robots that are gonna operate on you, right? Uh, um, we have the best technology. And I think that shows how patients accept these technologies. They accept our technologies uh, in healthcare, but we also know how they accept them outside of healthcare as well and how positive the public is to, to robotics. Uh, it also is interesting how doctors really uh, have embraced, for the most part, uh, medical robotics, as well as healthcare system. And of course, Intuitive Surgical has been a, a phenomenally successful company, over 10 million procedures done to date, uh, many millions being done each year now. Um, and so that hasn't gone unnoticed by a lot of folks in the field. The medical robotics uh, uh, field has, is booming, uh, spinoffs are booming, there are some very high uh, ac value acquisitions, uh, companies being purchased for, for enormous sums. Of course, there's failures like with everything and there are, are paths that, that, that aren't panning out. Um, but I think there's a couple of trends in the field that are particularly interesting. And these are developments from Oris Health. Oris was bought by Johnson & Johnson a few years ago for over $3.5 billion. Um, also, Intuitive Surgical, the real, the real leader in this field, is also developing a, a, a system called the Ion System. So Oris Health System is called the Monarch. And these are small, <clears throat> excuse me, small endoscopes, about four millimeters in diameter. So very tiny endoscopes with cameras, lights. Um, and and the, the, the point of these is, is what, what medical robotics is heading towards is, is smaller and smaller endoluminal devices that are guided along more torturous paths. In this case, the focus is on lungs, uh, bronchoscopy, going deep into the lungs, looking for lung disease, taking biopsy and removing them so you can find things earlier, things that don't show up necessarily in MR or CT or where you want to get a, a, a sample of that. I think that's interesting because what we're seeing is we're seeing medical robotics coming from sort of the large scale and moving moving down. But of course, uh, uh, the medical, the micro and nano robotics uh, uh, folks have, have kind of been thinking of it from the other way. And so, you know, when I look at, at the Monarch system, I look at the ION system, I think, you know, what's the next step? There's a limit to how we how, how small we can make these endoscopes 
And these catheters, they're guided, they have pull wires in them. They tend to be stiff and there's friction and you're just gonna have fundamental limits in your design there. Uh, and so at some point, what are we gonna do? Maybe we are going to actually release devices and let them go farther and deeper into your brain to unclog uh, the small blood clots that we don't even treat now or, or finding uh, cancer very early and, and avoiding structures in the brain, for instance, uh, as, we, as we search for that. Um, so like I said, We've been thinking about microrobots uh, uh, seriously, at least my group, since 2003, almost 20 years now. And um, we started by, uh, in, in ICRA 2007, published some work on micro swimmers, just trying to understand how we can make small things move at these scales, being um, inspired by bacteria and how they swim. We started to add functionality to those. Then we started thinking about soft structures and how they can adapt. Uh, and maybe reconfigure themselves. And, and more recently, what I'll talk about uh, if I have time at the end is on how we can actually start to program some of these devices. And, and what we're starting to see from our group and others now would, in the future, are we gonna actually see computation being performed on these? So there's a trend in this field. It's interesting, um, it's exciting. Um, but I think you know, one of the points of my talk is when you look at this, uh, and I, I hear this from my, my uh, undergrad students sometimes, they'll see what we're doing and they're like, what's robotics about what you're doing? It's like you're, you're just making small things. It's like microfabrication and materials, and that's certainly true. Materials and fabrication are key to this. Uh, I, my co-director of my lab, Salvador Pani, is a, a, a chemist. Um, and it's, it's been a really rich collaboration that we've been able to work together, me from the robotic side, him from the chemistry and material side. And there's some really challenging materials problems here. Uh, we see, you see a lot of cute robots uh, in the popular press, a lot of cute micro nano robots in the popular press. And you should always ask some very hard questions whenever you see these things dancing around. You should, you, you should figure out what kinds of materials they're made out of. Often they use toxic materials, toxic uh, magnetic materials, uh, polymers that you're never going to put in your body. And so, Focusing on the material side, on the biocompatibility and, and biodegradability side of this is, is critical, it's important, and it really limits the options of what you can do. And, and so we can always create cute devices, but we really need to think about some of the, some of the hard problems. One of the, the first things when we've worked in this field that we thought about, one of the key challenges was uh, power and actuation. How are you gonna uh, uh, move a small device, a device that's smaller than a millimeter, maybe even smaller than a micron in size? How are we gonna get energy in? Because batteries, uh, remember, are volumetric, uh, as volumes, uh, volume doesn't scale well. Uh, it's a cube, uh, cube of length, so uh, if you make it 10 times smaller, it's a thousand times, 10 times in length is a thousand times in volume. Uh, but, but we focused originally, first started, and this is what I mentioned in my 2003 talk, was magnetics. Uh, magnetics seems to make a lot of sense. We spent a lot of time thinking about magnetic fields and gradients, about rotating fields. Other folks have gone other paths and considered things like uh, catalytic motors and things driven by, by chemical reactions. Uh, the problem is a lot of these fuels are toxic, things like hydrogen peroxide or hydrazine, but there are still interesting research studies. Uh, other folks have looked at light and how these, these things might be driven by, by photonic reactions. Um, I'm not sure how you get light inside the body, but, but I'm sure there's, a, there's an answer to that. Uh, more recently, uh, one, of, one of the folks that was in my, land, in my lab, Daniel Ahmed, has been focusing on ultrasound and looking at how we can use this ultrasound energy we use to image in our bodies actually to collect that and to drive things. Daniel's now a, a professor at, at ETH and, and continues to go down this path. But we have kept our focus primarily on magnetics in my group. We think that there's still a lot to learn there. And so what I wanna to talk today a lot about is uh, uh, our, our, our how we use magnetics to drive our micro robots. I'm not gonna talk so much about how we make them, but how we, how we guide them and what are the issues there because these I think are fundamentally robotics. So just a little physics to start to make sure we all remember how this works. Uh, there's two, uh, we can generate forces and torques with magnetic fields. So the torques are, are, are pretty intuitive. If you, if you have a magnetic field, like imagine the Earth's magnetic field, and you put a magnetized body in it, uh, remember mag, uh, mag, mag, um, mag, magnets are dipoles, they always come with a north and a south pole, uh, that, will, that body will experience a torque to align it with that field, just like a compass needle. Forces are a little more complicated. The, the device is always oriented along the field lines, but then it's translating, moving its fields of force, pulling it in the direction of the increasing gradient of that field. So, so you've got a, a way to generate torques and for, forces and torques. So now the challenge is how do I build, how do I create these magnetic fields and field gradients that I need? How can I beam those in? Well, there's two ways to do it. 
One is you can take a bar magnet or a permanent magnet, a big chunk of, of a material like neodymium iron boron or samarium cobalt or something like that. You magnetize it and it will be permanently magnetized. It will not forget its magnetization. It has a north and a south pole. It has these flux lines, uh, these magnetic energy lines that when magnetic materials come in contact with them, they move. Um, and so one thing you could do is you could take that magnet and you could put it on the end of a robot arm. And then you could move that robot arm around to create these moving fields uh, and, and field gradients. And that's what Pietro Valdestri uh, has been doing and, and other folks uh, have been doing as well. Pe Pietro had a nice paper in Nature Machine Intelligence a couple of years ago where he was using this to guide magnetic colonoscopes um, in, in, in colon phantoms. Zhu uh, uh, Wei Zhao at uh, MIT uh, recently published a paper in Science Robotics where he was doing this. Uh, you see he's, he's got a permanent magnet uh, on the end of a um, uh, 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 robot arm, and in this case, Zhao Wei's uh, uh, guiding catheters into the brain uh, to treat neurovascular disease. But there's another way we can generate magnetic fields that don't require permanent magnets. And remember, you can't turn a permanent magnet off. I'm going to come back to that several times today. And that's with an electromagnet. Uh, electromagnets are, are relatively simple devices. You've got wire. You typically wrap it around a soft iron, a soft magnetic material like iron. Uh, put a current through it, and one of the advantages is that you can then uh, strengthen that current. You can you can put higher currents in it to strengthen the field. So now you can change the fields and the, the, those field gradients uh, just by without having to move anything except electrons. You can also reverse it, so you can reverse the polarity without having to move anything except the electric current going through it. And the big thing, one of the big wins is you can turn it off. So that gives you a level of safety. You're, you can just, if you've got, it's like hitting an e-stop on a robot. You can just turn it off and, and everything will cease to move. And so that's, uh, that's one of the keys here. And so we spent a lot of time in my group over the years thinking about how to make electromagnets. Um, we've modeled these, we've wrapped, we, we've got tons of copper, we've got tons of examples. Um, and, and this is one of our, our recent designs that's a patented design uh, that, is, that has a much higher density, energy density than any kind of electromagnet you're going to see probably on the, on the market, we think, by, a, by, by several factors. Um, if you remember the Japanese company Shaft that participated in the DARPA Grand Challenge, that was one of their, their innovations was uh, they, they used water-cooled electromagnets to guide their motors or water-cooled water cooled the coils to, so that they could get higher torque motors. They also had some, some tricks they played in the uh, electronics as well and were able to generate these humanoid robots that, had, that were really stronger than others because they could drive higher and higher currents through these than, than you normally could. Um, so you're not going to go just use a single electromagnet. It's, it's just going to create a field that gets bigger and smaller, but you can put these in configurations. You can put several together. The fields from each of those superpose. And so about uh, 12 years ago or so, when Jake Abbott was in my lab and group, he was working with my PhD student, Michael Kummer, they, they figured out a way, they understood a way where they could put this with, cast this within a robotics uh, type framework. Uh, and you see that vector on the right there, I, those are the N, uh, N the, each of those represents the current in each of the electromagnets. And then you, you, you pump this uh, through this mapping. That mapping uh, contains interest, inference, int uh, information on the geometry of, of the, the electromagnets, as well as M is the magnetization. That's the, the, the description of the micro robot and its magnetic properties, and P is its position in the workspace. And we can come up with the forces and torques that are being exerted on that. So we all recognize this as roboticists right away as a way we can control a multi-input, multi-output system like a robot arm. Um, so they're, they're, to me, um, almost identical. Uh, you know, with the, with the robot arm, we put in joint velocities, we go through the Jacobian, we get end effector velocities. With a, a set of coils, we put in currents, uh, we go through what we call our actuation matrix, and we're able to pr produce uh, time-varying, uh, uh, interesting magnetic fields and magnetic field gradients. And so, to me, they're, they're the same kind of a problem, but they're absolutely key to how we're going to guide these micro-robots when they are in our bodies. Um, one of the things when we first built the first, that system, last system I showed you uh, here was the Octomag. Um, uh, it, it, we used eight electromagnets, and the reason we used eight was because we'd done a lot of numerical simulations, and uh, eight seemed to work. The, the, the solutions looked better. The, the graphs, the plots we got looked better. We weren't quite sure why. So it wasn't until about five years after we built this when Andrew Petruska, who was in my group, started looking at the math and understanding it and was able to, to make some, some mathematical proofs to put minimum bounds 
on given a task, for instance, if I have a micro robot and I want to move it with five degrees of freedom, that is X, Y, Z, and then point along two directions, I'm not gonna get this motion out of it ever unless I play some, some tricks. Uh, but, but to do that, I'm gonna need, you know, when I first thought of that, I was like, I think, well, you probably want five independent actuators, but it turns out because of the coupling between fields and gradients and the way these are generated, there's actually, we can actually mathematically prove eight is the minimum number. We, we, we learned that numerically, but now we know that. Uh, uh, analytically, and we can also look at other tasks. Maybe we don't need five degrees of freedom, but we need fewer. What are the minimum numbers? And so that's important, of course, as a, as a designer to know what you're, you're going to have to shoot for. So we built a lot of electromagnets over, uh, over electromagnetic navigation systems over the years. Here's one of our large ones that do for, for large animal trials. Uh, but we started thinking uh, more deeply about this. And Quentin Baylor, who's here, started thinking about how, how are we going to describe the workspace of these electromagnetic navigation systems? Uh, workspace is a fundamental concept in robotic manipulators. How do you describe its workspace, where it can reach? Um, so one of the things to, to understand about electromagnets is there's a limit to how much current we can put through these electromagnets. There's a current limit due to, first of all, things get hot, they heat up. Uh, uh, the fundamental problem with electromagnets is getting the heat out. It becomes a thermodynamics problem. Uh, so you've got limits on that. You've got limits on your power supply, your drives, and all these things. So we need to, to think about uh, if we have, in this case, a, a 2D ca case, I've got two electromagnets, I have a, a device, a ma micro robot in here, and I have a point P. Um, and I need to start thinking about, at this point P, what sorts of fields do I have available to me? And through our actuation matrix, we can take our, our currents, our, our, these, these maximum bounds we have in our currents, and we can map these into the fields that we have available. And then we can start to think about uh, during a task, what I want to do with my micro robot, I want it to swim through your blood vessels or something like that, we can start thinking, uh, what fields and gradients am I going to need to achieve that? And is this uh, uh, feasible or is it infeasible? Do I need to rethink my problem? Do I need to rethink the way I've designed my electromagnet? So you can see how this, this starts working back now. We can start thinking about, about workspaces. We can start thinking about workspace metrics things like manipulability, or uh, which uh, a, a quite uh, a famous professor from uh, Kyoto University by the name of Professor Yoshikawa uh, proposed back in the mid 80s, which uh, was very inspiring to me as I was just getting into the field and trying to understand uh, robot assembly and that concept of putting a number and even a, a, you know this three dimensional ellipsoids uh, on the end of a manipulator and understanding how it was able to move in different directions was, was really fundamental. And so we draw a lot of info inspiration from people like that, people from Jean-Pierre Merlet. Um, and so what Quentin has proposed is, let's look at a point P, uh, it, 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 it's in, the, in a manipulator, in a uh, electromagnetic navigation system workspace, the MNS workspace. Let's look at what available fields and gradients it has, and let's look at what task, what it needs for the given task. And that distance then uh, is going to be our measure. And, and we show this in 2D, but this can extend, uh, you know, higher dimensions or, you know, extensions to, to uh, higher orders are, are uh, obvious, right? Uh, not exactly, but anyway, you can do it, right? Um, and so now we can start mapping out workspaces. So we can go through this entire workspace and we can start looking at all of the, the feasible regions and we can start using this for designing systems. So I've got my two coil system here, 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 is, here they are at 90 degrees. We can, I can start looking at how is my workspace, how is the available field, how are those changing as I change the angle uh, of these? Uh, or if I put them both on, on the same side and if I'm a, you know, as I'm thinking about this from a traditional robotics, standpoint, I look at putting my two electromagnets like this and they look like they're linearly dependent and they're not gonna, you know, there's gonna be some problem there. But remember we have these harmonic uh, functions that are coming out, these, these dipole fields that are quite uh, complicated, nonlinear, and so it doesn't quite work that way. But we can also start looking at what happens if we put them on one side and move it. And we can start then mapping out these workspaces. So in 2D, you can start to get a bit of an intuition. I think it's look interesting to look at this space and look here and you get things like voids in here. Uh, so you, you've got to go to things like interval analysis or discretization in your space. You know, there's all these problems which we all know, and we've been working on in this field for decades now, and they map into this problem very, very nicely. And of course, it extends to higher. That was a 2D. We can go to three coil systems, eight coil systems. Uh, we borrow a lot of work from uh, people like uh, Clement Goslin working in um, cable-driven robots. Uh, there's a lot of similarities between the wrench feasible regions of that and the magnetic wrench feasible regions, uh, workspaces uh, in micro robots. And so there's a lot of, it's what I consider, you know, the heart of our field in a lot of ways, a lot of fundamental kinematics 
uh, and hopefully in the future dynamics, which hasn't really been, been uh, we haven't looked closely at, in how we can design these systems. So we built a lot of these systems over the years. The first one, the Octomag, we realized in September of 2009, and what we were able to show with that system of eight magnets for the first time was very, very precise control in five degrees of freedom of a small magnetic device, we'll call a micro robot. This is a piece of nickel about a millimeter or two long. Uh, some things you'll notice, there's a lot of math going on in this plot. I always tell my, my students in my microbiotics course, if you understand this plot, you understand a lot of what, what, what I'm trying to teach you in, in about a quarter of the course. But you'll notice the device is always oriented, its long axis is always oriented with the field, and it's always moving, the, 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 the colors represent when the field's getting stronger or weaker. So that gives us um, uh, this kind of uh, 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 holonomic control over it and that's, that's, that's quite interesting. Um, I think uh, um, over the years we've we've learned a lot. We've we've built smaller systems. Uh, our, our original Octomag was designed for small animals. Then we built smaller systems for de for for microscopes to do this with cells. We built bigger systems for for human-sized uh, uh, structures. And I want to talk a little bit about that. But when you start thinking about what you might use for this, and we talked about healthcare at the beginning, medical robotics. Uh, You've got, to, you've got to have a strategic approach to this. You're not going to go to a doctor and say, oh, I've got a micro robot, let's put it in one of your patient's bodies and see if it works. You've got to work with, within the framework that they have. And so we started thinking that if instead of controlling micro robots with our systems, we instead took a catheter that can be uh, put deep into the body, deep into the brain or the heart or a, a kidneys or a number of places, and um, we can start to control that. So this is basically a micro robot with a tether on it or a, a catheter. And this is a nice video that uh, Roland Dreyfus is here uh, helped put together with, uh, with, with one of our spinoffs, Nanoflex. And it shows these complicated fields that are coming out of these, in this case, three electromagnetic coils. Uh, it, it's quite, it, it's, it's kind of beautiful in a way, but there's also some beautiful math in it. And so it shows the ways that you can bend these, these catheters. And, and I'll tell you, these catheters are, they look like a tube with a magnet on the tip, but there's actually a lot more design work that goes into getting the stiffness of them correct and also the magnetic configuration at the end is important. I won't go into those details, but that's also a big, big factor here. So what are we going to do with these things? Now we can guide catheters, we can guide them magnetically, we can guide the tip of a catheter. Uh, the first thing we thought about, and this was back around 2010, we started getting serious about this, was, was using this to guide catheters in the heart to treat heart arrhythmias. So people suffer for, for thing, from things like atrial fibrillation, particularly as you get older. And, and one of the treatments is to go in with a catheter and ablate portions of the heart. These electrophysiologists, I don't know how they figured it out, but they figured out where to go in and ablate little sections in the heart to kind of reset the, the paths of electrical signals there. So we realized a clinical system, brought it online in 2015 in a hospital outside of Zurich. Uh, you'll notice this big electromagnetic system, it weighs about seven tons or so, if I recall right. Uh, it comes apart in two halves, so the patient can be, can be prepped, then it comes together. Uh, you'll see down below here is where the, the surgeon is doing the, the, the procedure, and this is a 2.3 millimeter diameter ablation catheter that is guided within the heart, within the, the heart chambers to, to do the ablation procedures. Uh, here is, is Dr. Duru uh, uh, in, in the hospital guiding it. What you'll see up here is this is the uh, a mapping of the upper right atrium of a woman who is getting the procedure done this day. Um, he's plotting that out in, 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 on, graphically, and then he's guiding the, the uh, catheter tip. He's also monitoring this with x-ray, so he's got continuous x-ray radiation. And what he likes is he can sit back away from the x-ray radiation. In fact, what he says is, I can drink coffee while I'm doing surgery. Now, I've never seen him do it, but he says he can. Uh, but but we, we learned a lot. The systems function reliably. They no, nothing's really moved. There's a pump in there, but they, they're, they're stationary. Um, it, it takes some training. The doctors have to get used to, to use it. But because of limits in, in, in uh, resources, we, we couldn't really go back and redesign and put through the whole medical device regulation process. Uh, uh, new catheters, we used commercial off-the-shelf catheters, and we realized they weren't really perfectly designed for this task. But the thing which was obvious in hindsight is if you come to a hospital and you say, hey, I have this seven ton machine, it's gonna cost you millions of dollars, you're gonna to have to remodel your room, uh, can, we, uh, can we install it in your hospital? You realize uh, uh, that's a difficult sell. And so we started thinking more closely about uh, magnetic navigation systems and workflow integration. So we're not the first people to think about using magnetics to guide catheters. There's a, a company out of St. Louis, Missouri called Stereotaxis. And they have a system, they, a new system that just came out a couple of years ago called the Genesis system. And it has two large 
290 kilogram electromagnets. 200, that's, you know, over 600 pounds, right? Uh, magnets, they're moving around. Uh, they move slowly to guide the catheter within the, uh, the, the heart, They're also looking at, at ablation. They've, they've been on the market for about 20 years, maybe a little less. Uh, there's about 150 systems or so out there that are used. Uh, um, but it, again, these are permanent magnets. They can't be turned off. And when you create an op put it, them in an operating room, that's all that operating room is, is going to be able to be used for is this. So there's no other uses for that. Our, the, the, the system I showed you before was what we call a hybrid system because it could come apart. The electromagnets can be shut off. You can use the operating room as you normally did. And so that, that's a little, a little easier for a hospital to, to, to deal with and understand. But what we really wanted to do was try to figure out, can we make these portable? Can we make them where we can wheel them in and out of a hospital, uh, hospital operating room and get them to work uh, 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 relatively simply? And so that has resulted in a system we call the Navion. Uh, we also call it electromagnetic navigation system or remote magnetic navigation system, and it, it consists of four main parts. There's there's the uh, the unit itself that produces the, the magnetic fields. Uh, it weighs about three to four hundred kilograms. Uh, it has you just need cooling water to put it in. Regular tap water is fine, uh, and then make sure you have the right electrical plug in your in your operating room, and and you're and you're good to go with it. Uh, it also, we also work a lot now uh, these days on the catheters, the endoscopes, the guide wires, the devices, the tools that are going to be made. There's also another component to this system, which is the mechanical advancer. So you put your catheter in the mechanical advancer and it moves it back and forth. And then, of course, there's the software. In our lab, it's all, we use ROS. It's, this is a classic robotic system. So, of course, we want to uh, use the, the, the appropriate uh, uh, framework for that. So we use ROS. Um, as, as these gets translated out of the lab and into the clinic, then all that software has to be redone and, and rewritten under, under medical device uh, uh, regulations so that um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that systems in, in the clinic are going to be using ROS, but at least, uh, but at least that's where we do our, our research from. Um, it's portable. This is a system I, I just flew up yesterday from Hong Kong. We spent the last couple of weeks installing our, our first system in Asia. This is uh, uh, at the Multiscale Medical Robotics Center in the Chinese University of Hong Kong. This is a, a, a project funded by the Hong Kong government, and it's, uh, we, we were uh, involved with, there's, there's several different projects, but Imperial College is involved, uh, Johns Hopkins, Russ Taylor's group's involved, and then we're working on magnetic steering in this, and, and this is, uh, uh, we were just able to get this system up working and demoing it uh, last week, and that was quite exciting for us. We've had it up uh, in, in Europe, we've had it up to, um, Netherlands to Philips, we've had it uh, to a few of the hospitals around Zurich. Uh, so it's a very portable system. We can get it wheeled in and out with every, if all the connections are in place, we can get it in and out of an operating room in 10 minutes. We, it's almost like a Formula One a pit stop in a way. We could do it quite, quite rapidly. So what are we gonna do with it? I talked about cardiac ablation, but what we're focusing on with Navion right now is stroke. Um, stroke is the second leading cause of death in the world. Uh, and there are several different types of stroke, but the most common stroke, about 87% of strokes, are due to blood clots that get lodged somewhere in your, your neurovascular structure, typically around uh, your eyes. So you've got this circle of Willis, this uh, uh, circulating blood vessel that, that's delivering blood to your brain, and, and if parts of that get clogged, people start slurring their speech, their arm hurts, uh, they, they, they stumble, they have trouble walking, they, you know, the symptoms of stroke. And, and uh, what's important about that is that it gets treated very, very rapidly. Time is brain, as the neurosurgeons say. And as soon as you get uh, 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 signs, of, signs of stroke, you need to get to a hospital to figure out how we're going to get how to get rid of that blood clot. Uh, there are drugs that you can be injected with that will dissolve it, but there's a lot of um, uh, um, contraindications for that. Uh, a lot number of patients, if you wait too long, it doesn't help. Um, and a lot of patients have, have bad reactions to that. So some years ago, not too long ago, but a few years ago, uh, mechanical thrombectomies were shown in clinical studies to be a, a very efficacious way of dealing with stroke. And that means you put a catheter in the femoral artery of, uh, of the patient, you snake it all the way up uh, across the aortic arch, and then bring it up and uh, bend it up and go deep into the brain and try to remove, try to remove that clot mechanically. And so uh, it's, it's uh, 
an important procedure to be able to do. It's got to be done uh, uh, quickly. It takes years of experience for interventional neuroradiologists to understand the, the, the mechanics of how they do that. Uh, the way it's done right now is they start with a guide wire or a catheter that's bent at the tip. They insert it near your groin in that, and they, they, they push it up from, from down here, and then they're looking under x-ray radiation. They're looking at your brain and seeing where it's going, and, and they're trying to basically push, pull, and rotate back here to guide the tip of that. So this is a classic non-collocation problem. Uh, you're actuating something from far away where the task is. And it's a challenge, but these guys, the, the, uh, the surgeons who do this are amazing, but it takes them years to learn these skills. And there are still places they have trouble getting to. Um, so our thought is our magnetic navigation system uh, can use uh, the magnetic fields. Remember, it's, not, it's, it's just the mechanic, the advancer is just pushing and pulling, but it's the tip that we're actually steering. And so that gives you a, a level of control where you're actually creating actuation where the task is. This is in my lab back at uh, ETH. Uh, on the upper left is, is a, a, I don't know if you can tell, but it's a phantom. It's, it's basically a, a, a bunch of silicon tubes that, that mimic a human a neurovascular system, cardiovascular system. That's an x-ray radiation of a 3D printed aorta on the right. Um, down below, you see we use PlayStation as an input for that. Uh, turns out the gaming industry uh, has, has given a lot of thought to in, input devices. And, and like RS Health kind of cap, cop, copied a, an Xbox, we sort of, we are using uh, PlayStation controllers. Uh, and then there's, there's the software and how you can control that. So this gives you a level of control of the catheter tip. You don't have to worry about those bends. It can be straight. You can bend it at will when it's in the body, depending on how the task is, uh, is uh, uh, going. Um, it also allows you to do things uh, much, much more quickly. So on the, on the right is the classic bent catheter that's being pushed, pulled, and turned. And on the left is a magnetically guided catheter. And you just have much faster control. Remember, time is brain. Uh, and, and sometimes when, when surgeons are doing these procedures, they found that they get the wrong bend and they have to come back and, and put in another, uh, pull in another catheter, you risk infection and all these things. So if we can do this quickly, there's a lot of advantages to that. Um, and also as we think about catheter design, we can come up with new designs. And uh, uh, this is uh, above is a simple magnetic catheter. You can get around three turns or so in before it gets, there's too much friction. But with, uh, with new designs and new thoughts, we can basically go just about anywhere. We, we have catheters that can tie themselves in knots. Now, not that you'd ever want a, a catheter to do that, but the fact that you can make one to do that, I think, is, is quite impressive. I think they're, they're the, world, the, the most torturous catheters I've ever seen anyway. So I think there's, there's quite uh, some possibilities here. Here's um, uh, Dr. Philip Gruber. He's a, an interventional neuroradiologist. He, he spent about six or seven years learning how to do these procedures. This is a large animal study he did with our group. There's a, a 700 micron diameter catheter there that he's guiding up uh, this large animal uh, into the brain of this large animal, guiding it with our, our uh, uh, PlayStation controller. All these magnetic fields are being generated and, 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 and causing this uh, uh, device to turn in just the way he wants. It looks like a 2D image here, but what he, Dr. Gruber has in his head is the 3D nature of these, uh, of these blood vessels and how they move and knowing the twists and turns that he needs to make. One of the things that, that very much improved him or impressed him was this sharp bend he was able to make from the uh, what's called the maxillary, maxillary artery to the caudal articular artery. Uh, which goes from a large vessel to a small vessel, and it's over a 120 degree bend. Uh, he says that would have been, a, he's not sure he could have ever done that in a human, and if he, he did, it probably would have taken him um, a long time, hours possibly, and sometimes he does spend hours just trying to get these things threaded into the right blood vessel to try to reach that blood clot in the brain. So, um, so there's a lot of opportunities here. I think there's a lot of, of, of reasons we may want to look at um, how these, these devices work. Here's a, a nice uh, little, uh, uh, another animation that, that kind of shows further the concept. This is our, our Navion that can be wheeled in. These are the, uh, the magnetic fields emanating from the three electromagnets. And you see by changing coils in each one, the different types of, of uh, uh, field uh, 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 flux densities you're getting out of there and different fields, different uh, torques and forces you can generate on that, uh, on that catheter tip. Um, you can get some very nice bends with it, which um, is a big deal if you're, if you're trying to get in somebody's brain and, and you can do that. Uh, this is uh, obviously an animation of, of a patient and, and you'll see the mechanical catheter advancer there at, at the, near their hip. Uh, there's a catheter that's 
that's in there. Uh, actually, it'll start with a guide wire. This will be a little guide wire with a, uh, uh, this blue, blue uh, uh, structure is a guide wire with a magnet on the tip. And actually, there's a sequence of magnets. And then behind it is the follower. That's, the, that's actually what's going to do the work, but it's the first uh, the guide wire that's, that's leading the path. And it's our fields then that we generate that are able to make these sharp turns. This is going up the aortic arch, uh, now deeper into the brain. Um, there could be some very interesting geometries. And, and, and as this goes up further, then the, uh, the uh, doctor can be feeding the, the working catheter behind it, following it. Uh, we can make very sharp turns, uh, circular turns like you saw before, and then you'll, you're just starting to see up at the top of the image there uh, what they're shooting for, which in this case is, is a, a thrombus, a, a, a blood clot in there. Um, and this very sharp turn can take a long time to do, but with our systems, these can be done more readily. You're exerting the torques right on the tip. Now we pull the guide wire back, and the working catheter, this is an aspiration catheter, just sucks that, uh, sucks that blood clot in, and the patient is... Uh, hopefully uh, being able to recover. For every 30 minute delay in uh, treating a blood clot like that, you have a 10% uh, 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 decrease in your chance of recovery and, uh, and you're gonna just have, have worse and worse recovery the longer you wait. So these are quite important to do. There's a lot more we can do with this system and we see it as a platform technology. Um, we can look at other types of neurovascular issues like crossing large, uh, um, aneurysms, we, we still look at cardiac ablation and using it for that. Uh, we're also developing uh, uh, gastroscopes. These are upper, upper GI, upper, up, uh, upper GI endoscopes as well as small GI endoscopes. And recently I've been working with fetal surgeons, which is fascinating. About a month ago, I got a call that they were gonna do a fetal surgery and made it, went up to the woman's hospital and saw a twin to twin transfusion uh, procedure in which we had two twins uh, that were about 20 weeks old um, and one of them was taking more of the blood from the other one. And so they've actually figured out how they can go in now, uh, surgeons, and ablate the, the blood vessels on the placenta in order to balance out the blood flow between those twins. If, if there's an imbalance, it's bad actually for both twins, and there's a good chance you would lose both. So these are it, it, one of the, I mean, all surgeries I see are amazing, but that was certainly uh, one of the most amazing ones. And so getting in there with these little laser uh, ablation tools and, and moving them around is, is uh, something that we also think our system can, can uh, do. So that's sort of where a lot of this has gone, but uh, I want to come back now and finish up and talk about micro robots. As I said, over the years, we started with very, very simple devices. Uh, we started thinking about materials, adapt, adaptability. Uh, a lot of this is just fundamental material science. Uh, a lot of it's very much related to the soft robotics community. But what we've been thinking about lately are programmable devices. And um, I was having a, a, a conversation with Laura Heiderman. She's a, a physicist at the Paul Scherer Institute in ETH Zurich. And she works in nanomagnetism. Now, remember, I talked about soft and hard magnetic materials, and, and, and coercivity is a measure of that. And with the regular magnetic material, it typically has several domains in it that we magnetize. Uh, and, and depending on the material, it can either be soft or it can be a permanent magnet. It can remember its field easily. But what I didn't understand was that there's a small range in the hundreds of nanometer range. And if you take this kind of racetrack shape and you just change the size of it, you're able to change its coercivity just by changing the size. So I can use the same material, for instance, cobalt. Uh, and by just changing the size of that racetrack, I can change the coercivity. And so that's telling me now that I have a chance by, as I put in external magnetic fields, if I put in high enough fields, I can start flipping the magnetism of these devices in situ. So that in, to me is a, in, in a sense is programming these devices in situ. So what we did was we took one of our soft micro robots. This is just a, four panels uh, connected with, uh, with flexible hinges. And we patterned uh, with e-beam lithography uh, these, these patterns and then by by exposing them to magnetic fields in strong field in one direction, a weaker field in a little bit of the direction, I can get some of the some of those bits of, of uh, to remember their magnetization. The other ones to forget and go in the other direction. Um, I can also do this in different directions. Uh, and with this four panel device, I was able to program, we were able to program 16 different uh, configurations. So we'd be able to actually just by, by you know, in situ, by, by going through the right sequence, do that and, and, and then uh, with the exact same device in the exact same magnetic field, demonstrate that it could exhibit four different behaviors uh, in, in this case. So you can see, these are really small, right? These are, are tens of microns. They're a fraction of the width of a hair. 
give you a sense. Now we can take that a, a little bit further. Um, and Tia uh, Chan Yun Wang, who's now a professor at the Peking University, and, uh, and uh, uh, Laura's student Chui, who's now, I think he's at Cornell, they thought about origami cranes. And so they kind of uh, thought, well, what if we, we pattern the different parts of a, of a crane? These are foldable devices. They're not the classic Japanese origami crane, but you've, you've, they're inspired by that. But we can pattern different, different parts of this. And so then we can, by, by taking that crane and exposing it to different magnetic fields, we can demonstrate different behaviors. For instance, a flapping behavior, or a turning behavior, or a hovering behavior, or a side slipping behavior. So the exact same device, just by reprogramming it, basically exposing it to different types of fields, uh, blasting those in, and then, and then actuating it with lower fields, I can program this device to move in different ways. Um, it's it's kind of interesting you think of this, you can think of those little uh, uh, devices on there as being um, almost bits, right? But they're not just zeros and ones, they also have a physical meaning. So you're really embodying intelligence uh, in a real sense. So, so you're, you're, it's kind of like memory on a disk drive, but that memory does more than just remember the state. It also has a, a, an ability to actuate the device. And I think that there's, that's interesting. And I think there's a lot of planning, a, a lot of design, a lot of work that our community can, can, can jump on here. And I think there's some, some interesting things that we can do in, in programming um, nanoscale uh, devices. So uh, I've got a few summary slides here to kind of wrap up the, uh, some of my messages. The first is electromagnetism re remains our actuation method of choice. There are other ones out there and I, I think they're very interesting, but we've, we've stuck with it for uh, uh, 20 years and I think we're gonna, we're gonna stick with it in the near future. Uh, we've learned a lot in nanomagnetism. It's inspired us to think of a lot of other kinds of devices too um, that are programmable um, uh, while in vivo and also reconfigurable. Uh, there's a lot to explore in this field. So many things. You, when, if, if you're into kinematics and you saw some of the stuff I showed from, from, from Quentin Baylor's paper. Oh, well, by the way, that paper just appeared in Transactions and Robotic this month, I think. So it should be online now that describes some of that work. Uh, you realize there, there are so many there are so many questions that we can ask, and we really still don't understand the the answer to. So I think fundamental robotics plays a key role in a lot of these challenges we have in in this area. Um, in terms of medical robotics, uh, there's been success in the field. Intuitive Surgical is a company I haven't checked its valuation lately, but it's, it was often near 100 billion dollars. Uh, very profitable country company, successful in many ways. Um, and there's other companies now that we're starting to see are, are enjoying some success. But, but these new ideas that we're developing in our research community take a long time to get out. And, and, and I think there's a lot of reasons for that. There's a lot of reasons for failure. Uh, one is we underestimate how hard these things are. We underestimate the complexity of the task. You know what? Robotics has done that forever. Um, I remember, I'm not, the name escapes me, a few years ago somebody sells, said self-driving cars was a solved problem. And, uh, uh, I, I think uh, we often don't realize how hard some of these problems are. Uh, we often, uh, in, as engineers, come in and think we can solve the problem, but we really need to understand at a deeper level the surgical workflow. Uh, how, how do things go on? Why are things organized the way we're in the operating room? How can we work within that, but also at the hospital level? And how do we work within departments and things like that? Uh, also, it, doctors are conservative, and I'm glad they're conservative. They're not going to come in and try some treatment they're not sure about on you. They want, they'll, they'll only make small increments in safe situations. Incremental change is good, and of course, if you want to submit a paper somewhere, you want to kill a paper uh, as a reviewer, the, first, the thing you can say is, that's an incremental result, right? But in our field, we, in, in this field, you need to think incrementally and have a strategy. And the other thing is these require tremendous investments to get them out of the lab through the regulatory process uh, and into the clinics, and so wrong business models are also uh, we need to think about. Um, and then the bigger question is, you know, is, are these things only for rich countries? Are we going to have any impact to surgery worldwide? So one very, just a few last comments I want to make, you know, uh, on, on what the future of this could be or might be uh, is you realize there's almost 8 billion people in the world right now. It turns out 5 billion people uh, five billion of the eight billion don't have access to safe, affordable surgery or anesthesia. But a third of human disease is amenable to surgery. So uh, there's a lot of people out there that really aren't getting the treatments that they need, the surgical treatments. Uh, we hear a lot about HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundations, these kinds of things, and there's success in that, and that's fantastic. Uh, but it's still only a small part of the disease burden. There's still a lot of issues out there that need to be solved. Uh, surgery has been called the neglected stepchild of global health, 
you know, so what is it? Can we do anything in this area that helps? Well, I think in stroke, it might be interesting. There might be something we can do because uh, I was just down in Botswana a couple of weeks ago. I was in South Africa at a clinic a few, uh, almost a year ago. Uh, you know, in, in South Africa, the clinic, if you show up there with a stroke, you have eight hours, you have an eight hour truck ride to get to the nearest center that could possibly treat you. And by that time, you've, you've lost a lot of your functionality. So uh, one of the things that hopefully medical robotics and these tools are going to do is democratize surgery. And that means we're going to be able to train more and more uh, healthcare professionals to do more difficult procedures um, that they normally wouldn't be doing. And the other thing is that I think uh, makes a lot of sense, particularly for stroke treatment, is telesurgery, where you have experts at the large centers who are able to communicate to outlying clinics when these things need to be do, done very, very quickly. Okay, so I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brad. To bring us a very exciting talk. I think, okay, we have a lot of questions and also comments and what maybe discussions. If you have a question, please go to your microphone as well. Okay, go there. Okay, please. Hi, this is Toshi Fukuda. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, Brad, always thank you very much. Such a wonderful, spin kind of talk. Uh, I have a kind of couple of questions because of this, this is so interesting, so exciting area, what you mentioned, Rosie. Uh, particularly, you mentioned such a kind of a, a talk, uh, talk catheter system for big anaerobium. So this is also another big challenge, particularly such a kind of a, a force control aspect of the robotic manipulation, micro manipulation. Because as we know, the kind of today's conventional intervention, we are interested in only such a kind of posture control or such a kind of catheter. But here you mentioned such a good thing about a talk a catheter. It's a kind of part of such a kind of a, uh, force control aspect from the viewpoint robotics. So can you think a little bit more about those things? Also one more, kind of reconfigurable kind of things. I like such a kind of reconfigurable robot, as you know, such a could to talk about some more about such a kind of a catheter tip. Just to have a, another kind of tip, several function, such a kind of thing. Nice to have a kind of multiple function. Uh, at the tip using such a magnetic kind of a control system. Thank you. Right. Oh, thanks, Toshi. Thanks for the question. Um, so I, I, let's see, I, I think you're asking about uh, torque, torque catheter force control. So, so, you know, the way these catheters are, 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 are typically moved is you push, pull, and you rotate. Now that rotate is, is often to guide it, but it also helps it, it, it move up the structure. So, so that rotation actually can interact with the tissue and help, help move the catheter along. Um, you mentioned force control, and yeah, we would love to have force sensors on there. Uh, of course, these are very small devices, so it's difficult to integrate. Um, I think uh, when, when, when the uh, surgeons are pushing from the back, they do get a bit of a sense of touch, and so it's important to, to recognize that. Uh, but these are the classic robotic manipulation problems. How do you integrate force sensing? Uh, um, what kind of force sensors? Are they reliable? Um, and I think these are interesting areas that we need to explore. Okay, thank you. Next question. Okay, please. Hi. Uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. Uh, so you started off by showing us some Maxwell's equations. And if you look at, if you solve the Maxwell's equations, and particularly for a plane wave, you find that the ratio of electric field to the magnetic field is equal to the speed of light. So basically, eight orders of magnitude more. So have you considered using dielectrophoretic forces uh, basically, electric field instead of magnetic field. Uh, see, I, I, I didn't hear all that, but it was about Maxwell's equations. We only use we only use two of those. We use <laughs> there's no magnetic monopoles, uh, and and then we use the um, uh, basically the uh, uh, the one from uh, Gauss, right? Uh, uh, so we don't do any any electric field generation. We're not using any any electric fields here because the body that that interacts with the body. Magnetic fields are are what what is uh, we're very comfortable with, and so we only stick with those. There have been some work people have tried to to guide things at the surface with electric fields, but but that won't work very, uh, deeply. Um, but I think uh, yeah, that's where we start in my course is on Maxwell's equations, what the implications of those are. Um, and, and how a, a lot of this falls out. So you can go to some of our papers and see where the, the basic force, 
force equations come from directly from that. So um, I'm not thank sure you I answered your question, right? Okay, thank Sorry, you. Is there any other questions? Okay, please. Uh, thank you very much. That was a really motivating talk. Um, and, and a big motivation for it seemed like you reflecting on the past 20 years and kind of 20 years ago, you thought about what are the, what is the grand challenge in this field? So what do you see now as you reflect on the next 20 years and kind of think about what is the next grand challenge? Oh, that's a great question. I hope you invite me back in 20 years to give another plenary talk. I'm going to do it a 60-year uh, stint. Uh, uh, what are, what's a grand challenge in this field? Um, well, I mean, to me, the, the big challenge right now is releasing the micro robots and letting them swim freely. Um, and there's a lot of folks working on that, and not a lot, but a few groups working on that, using swarms of particles uh, to guide them and move them through to treat things like, like uh, uh, blocked vessels in the brain. Uh, right now, we can pull out big blood clots. We can't get to small ones, and, and they think that has a, an impact. So can we make small micro devices that can actually go deeper into the brain? That's the next grand challenge I hope to see. Uh, before I retire, I think that's going to be, I think we'll see it. Um, uh, and then I think as, as these uh, uh, systems become adopted in hospitals, you know, there's a lot of smart people out there. They're going to have some really creative ideas, but uh, it, it'll be fun to see where it goes in the next 20 years, I think. Okay, thank you. I think uh, we time time. We have give a last question. Okay, please. Okay. Yeah, your turn. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I loved it. It was very interesting. Um, I was wondering if, um, as different uh, materials have different magnetic properties and magnetic fields uh, propagate differently, is this a problem when you are moving the, the, like the, the catheter along the body? Do you have to adjust it as you're moving and, for example, you enter into the cranium? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Material selection is key to this. I didn't go into detail. We always use neodymium iron boron for our catheters because it's the best permanent magnet. Actually, neodymium iron boron was discovered simultaneously in the US and Japan back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. Uh, and it's the best, it's the best permanent magnet on the market. Um, and so that's what we use for catheters, but we can't use that for micro robots because it's a toxic material. Neodymium is toxic. And so we have to use iron oxide that reduces the amount of force we can generate, but it gives us a lot of biocompatibility capabilities. And so we, we spend a lot of time thinking about the best way to make these. And I have one of my, uh, one of the guys in our lab makes what I consider the best iron oxide particles in the world right now. And it's his own zone own brew uh, and, and doing that. I think these things are, are key to what, uh, to a, a big part of what we're doing. So.